So what is the vegetative state? It's typically glossed as a state of wakefulness without awareness. So if you want a three-word gloss, that's what folks will give you. Uh, slightly more illuminating is uh, the following description from the Royal College of Physicians a few years ago. There should be no awareness of self or the environment in these patients, no response to external stimuli of a kind that would suggest volitional purpose as opposed to reflexes, and no evidence of language expression or comprehension. It's not entirely clear whether this is meant to be a definition of what it is to be in the vegetative state, or whether it's meant to be a gloss on, as it were, the clinical criteria for the ascription of the vegetative state. I suspect probably the latter. These folks aren't philosophers, and that's a distinction that only a philosopher might really care about. But for reasons that we'll see, it's a distinction that's, that's relevant to, to what we're talking about. But there you have it. That's, as it were, the entry point into the swimming pool of disorders of consciousness. The vegetative state is typically contrasted with what's called the minimally conscious state, uh, a, a notion, a term that's only 15 or so years old, um, but has a lot of traction in the literature now, so that's a standard distinction. Why is it called the minimally conscious state? People don't typically tell you, uh, but here are my, here's my guess. Uh, minimal, I think, for, for at least two reasons. One is because patients are thought to have what's called a low level of consciousness. I don't particularly like the term levels here, but I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that point, the, but the, the idea is that they're conscious not in the full-blooded sense that you or I might be conscious. They're not capable, typically, of complex behaviors or communication, but they have some conscious contents, some conscious processes. So the low level here is meant to be um, a way of picking out the fact that consciousness is interestingly, importantly restricted. Minimal also in the sense that they don't manifest consciousness reliably, and I think this has both a temporal and, a, as it were, associative um, dimension. Sometimes they seem to manifest consciousness, other times they don't. And some of the behaviors that you would expect of someone who is conscious are manifested, while at the very same time others might not be. So there's, as it were, inconsistent cues. On the one hand, you might have evidence of consciousness, you might have also evidence of the lack of consciousness, and that what th that's what... Um, makes one of the reasons people are inclined to call this cohort of patients minimally conscious. All right, so in light of that distinction, um, folks are worried about a number of things. Here's one thing that people in this field are worried about, that objective behavioral assessments of residual cognitive function can be extremely challenging in these patients. Motor responses may be minimal, inconsistent, difficult to document, hard to pick up, especially on a routine clinical examination. They may be there, but they may be subtle. They may be inconsistent. Now, I think what Owen and Coleman have in mind here is not so much a worry about which behavioral responses are indicative of consciousness, but the ability to pick up on what behavioral responses are there. But there's a deeper issue here, which I think is really interesting, which is it's not clear what behavioral responses are indicative of consciousness. So here's, a, uh, just a, in a sense, a toy example of this problem. Um, Take visual pursuit. So if you put uh, a moving stimuli in front of the patient's eyes, in some patients you'll get sustained visual pursuit. Other patients you won't, or you'll get very short, e either no visual pursuit or very, very short fleeting visual pursuit. Now, typically, visual pursuit is taken to be indicative of the minimally conscious state. Uh, people think that if you show visual pursuit, you're conscious. That's part of the normal given criteria for description of the minimally conscious state. I see some people are <laughs> shaking their heads in, <laughs> in puzzlement. I, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I believe that's a, a standard gloss. Um, contrast that with the blink response to threat. So if you move your fingers towards the eyes, um, typically you'll get a blink response to perceived visual threat. And that is clearly not regarded as evidence of the minimally conscious state. If you show only the blink response to threat, but not visual pursuit, you'll be diagnosed as vegetative. If you show visual pursuit, you'll be moved up into the minimally conscious state, and potentially your moral status will have changed somewhat in, in important ways. Now, maybe someone has a story as to why visual pursuit is indicative of consciousness and blink response to threat isn't. If so, I'd like to hear it. I've looked in the literature, and I've found nothing. The closest you get to an argument in this literature 
that visual pursuit is indicative of the minimally conscious state and blink response to threat isn't, is that the guidelines <laughs> for the visual, for the minimally conscious state indicate visual pursuit should be regarded as indicative. <laughs> it's not an argument, right? It's just a stipulation. You just don't get an argument. You really don't get an argument. Um, okay, so that's one issue, and we'll, we'll come back to that in different ways. Yeah? That's in a in a sense the question. What what is our grounds yes, for I believing? Yes, now I saw for example there are other procedures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we tend yeah. to believe it. Yeah. We tend to find it to be suspect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I yeah. Is there is there ever so there probably clearer behavioral of it, you know markers of minimally conscious state, and maybe they correlate. So they m they might, and that would be that something would be that 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 would be an argument. Um, as a th as I understand it, the correlation is not particularly strong. <laughs> but the issue of the correlation is interesting, and I'll, I'll come but back that to that. Be it would be something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. I was awake till four working on the other slides, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm happy just to stop on slide four, really. <laughs> uh, I do actually mean that in all seriousness. Um, okay. So that's the first bit. That's preamble for Owen and Coleman to the use of um, fMRI and EEG to detect consciousness in these patients. So they say functional neuroimaging suggests a novel solution to the problem, the problem of inconsistent difficult to document behavioral responses. Activation studies can be used to assess cognitive functions in altered states of consciousness without any, the need for any overt response. So overt behavioral response, maybe you still need a response on the part of the patient. Okay, so I take it lots of people think, um, endorse what I'm gonna call moderate. Neural measures can establish the presence of consciousness in behaviorally non-responsive patients. Certainly Owen uh, has carved a second career for himself wi with that claim and, and a number of people have endorsed it. Um, open question and one I'm going to raise at various points as to how the neural measure might establish that and, and in which behaviorally non-responsive patients. There's a stronger claim uh, floating around in the literature which I've called radical that neural measures are better, perhaps more reliable, more objective more robust than behavioral measures when it comes to working out who's really conscious and, and, and who's not. Um, and this is something that a few philosophers have, have toyed with recently. I'm not going to say much about radical. I just want to note one thing. I mean, why might you endorse this r more radical position? Well, you might think it's because there's a more intimate connection, more metaphysically intimate connection between the neural basis of consciousness and consciousness than the behavioral manifestation. You might think neural states and conscious states, maybe they're not identical, but the neural state realizes the conscious state in a way that the behavioral response doesn't realize it's more contingent. Um, and because of that, you might think that there's a sense in which when you have to put the two up against each other, uh, the neural evidence, as it were, should trump the behavioral yeah. evidence. Well, I'm not entirely sure that there is a more intimate <laughs> metaphysical connection between the behavioral basis and the conscious states. I mean, if you're a certain kind of functionalist about consciousness, then the behavioral state stands in, depending on how you describe it, there's a, there's a case to be made for thinking that it stands in a pretty intimate relation to the conscious state. But leaving that to one side, the thought at least runs the risk of confusing metaphysical and epistemic connections. Even if the metaphysical connection between the neural state and the conscious state is more metaphysically intimate than the connection between the behavioral state and the conscious state, separate question whether that translates into an epistemic kind of privilege. Th there's a lot to say about this issue. I just want to sort of point out that there are some interesting issues here for philosophers in mind and move on. Okay, so I'm going to focus on what I call moderate here, uh, that in some cases at least, neural evidence can establish uh, presence of consciousness in behaviorally non-responsive patients. Okay, another terminological issue I want to get on the table uh, well, a, sorry, a terminological issue is what are we going to call these patients? Uh, there's really two options. Uh, 
We could say that they're genuinely vegetative. And if we do that, we break the conceptual connection between being vegetative and being unconscious. And that, to many people, is a bit odd. Uh, vegetables, unless you're a panpsychist, vegetables are typically not thought of as conscious. Uh, or we could say that they're apparently vegetative, um, but they're um, behaviorally uh, non-responsive. So some people have, have started talking about a new category uh, for these patients, which is say they're not really vegetative, they're just behaviorally non-responsive. Um, you know, in a sense, it's just it's just housekeeping. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I find myself going back and forth between talking about them as vegetative, but also potentially conscious, and talking about them as non-responsive. Um, so it doesn't really matter. It's stipulative. But but those are our two options. Okay. The really central non-terminological issue is why I regard these patients as conscious. That's the central issue. Well, in a short, it's because they seem to show signs of implicit cognition. Um, that's the connection to this workshop. By implicit, I don't mean what other people have meant by implicit. So here's the... <laughs> <laughs> What's the connection? <laughs> right. So this is the five minutes where I justify why my talk is uh, <laughs> in this, <laughs> in this um, workshop. Um, so I, the notion of implicit is implicit as covert. That's the notion of implicit that I'm working with here, which is, seems to me a reasonable gloss on what one means by implicit. And a number of the papers published in this is literature, some of them would talk about covert cognition, some of them talk about um, implicit cognition. So what is this? It's implicit, it can't be expressed or manifested in the subject's behavior. Now, so, and it's conscious cognition that can't be expressed or manifest. Well, at least that's the kind of covert cognition that I'm going to focus on. Now, when you make that claim, you need to also be prepared at some point, maybe not straight away, to tell a story about why it can't be expressed or manifest. Because we think it's sort of part of the essence of cognition, especially conscious cognition, that it's open um, to view, that it has, that has effects, that conscious subjects are agents. There's two stories lurking in the wings here. One is that the motor pathways are damaged. This is the story that Owen tells when you press them. The parallel here is with a total locked-in syndrome patient, right, where it's just the lights are all on, perfectly normal cognition, but there's just no way of expressing that. Even the one response modality, eye blink or eye movement, has been, has been turned off. The thought would be there's a parallel with the total locked-in syndrome, not that these patients are totally locked in because locked-in people have a normal level of consciousness. Level of consciousness is massively depressed here, but the parallel is you can explain why there's no manifestation, expression of the conscious state by talking to motor problems. The other idea which Colin Klein's been pushing and I think is really interesting is a parallel with akinetic mutism. Problem isn't, as it were, with output, motor output, but with the formation of intentions. Patients simply aren't interested, maybe they don't have the capacity in some more fundamental sense to form intentions. Um, again, Klein's not saying that these patients are akinetically mute, he's just pointing to that as a, as a parallel. Um, I don't, maybe different stories are gonna account for different groups of patients. Um, my point here is one does need a story as to why the covert is, is not overt. Okay, but that's one notion of implicit. That's the notion I'm going to focus on. The contrast is with two other notions. Uh, there are lots of notions of implicit. There's a five or six kicking around in the literature. Here's another one, implicit as unconscious. So in the perception literature, this is typically what people mean by implicit literature. So if, for example, when Dretzky writes about implicit perception, unconscious perception, he goes back and forth between talking about implicit perception and unconscious perception. And that's typically standard. What's that? Well... It's detectable only by implicit measures. What's an implicit measure, you ask? That's a very good question. We sort of know them when we see them. That's the thought. But it's a very good question how to distinguish implicit measures from explicit measures. One thing I'm inclined to say, I know it's not very helpful, but it strikes me as something worth saying anyway, is that explicit measures involve expressing a state. So reporting pointing, they express the content of, of, of the state. Implicit measures sort of manifest it in some way. 
They bring it out into the open, but there's no sense in which the subject is expressing it. Um, exactly how to apply this distinction to nonverbal creatures, babies, not pre -linguistic, non linguistic animals, it's difficult. Um, I mean, the clear case is the explicit measure of asking someone in verbal report. Um, <laughs> but I realize that this doesn't wear its meaning on its sleeve, but I think this is one way in to trying to separate implicit measures from explicit measures. There's another distinction I want to get on the table here, in part because it ties in, at least in my mind, maybe not anyone else's, uh, with Anandi's talk, which is that there's two types of implicit measures. Um, it seems that there's some implicit measures are content respecting. That is, we sort of pick up on them because they involve intelligible transact transitions between contentful states. So take word stem completion, right, where you get a prime get a masking sort of paradigm, uh, you get primed with lettuce, and then you consciously see the stem let, and then you see whether people are more likely to complete it with lettuce. That's an intelligible transition. We sort of say, oh, they must have consciously seen um, lettuce, sorry, unconsciously seen lettuce, um, because it makes sense of the response. Whereas there are other kind of implicit measures, which are just based on correlations, physiological measures, neural measures. They're just correlational. So our justification for thinking that these measure the state in question is going to be a posteriori. Perhaps not so for the content respecting implicit measures. All right. What does implicit mean in the implicit bias literature? And does it simply mean unconscious? Well, there are some suggestions in some of the classical papers that it does. Um, so here's Greenwald. And Banaji, I won't read it out, but I mean the abstract, well, I'll read out one sentence from the abstract, second sen or third sentence there. The identifying feature of implicit cognition is that past experience influences judgment in a fashion not introspectively known by the actor. Um, and I think it's often glossed in this literature that implicit here just, just means um, not conscious, not introspectively accessible. We had some discussion yesterday that there might often be cases where people are introspectively aware or can be brought to be introspectively aware of their implicit attitudes. Here are a couple of papers which go into this in some detail. This is references I got from some of Eric's work. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the arguments that they give, but I found them relatively persuasive that there's at least a significant degree of introspective awareness of something in the vicinity of implicit attitudes. Even if you don't buy their arguments, at least seems to be intelligible. This is sort of the central point. It's intelligible that implicit attitudes are conscious, in which case there's daylight between the notion of implicit as used in this literature and implicit as used in the sense of unconscious. We must be able to make sense of a conscious implicit attitude, even if such attitudes are really, are rarely uh, conscious. I realize that you disagree with that, but that's a, that's a discussion for coffee afterwards. <laughs> okay, so what, what I mean, what what do we say about implicit um, in the in the attitudes literature? So I mean, it's a tricky issue, and I think um, Jules and others were sort of wrestling with this yesterday. But uh, I mean, I'm inclined to say something like this: it's it doesn't involve r representations that are under the subject's reflective control. I don't know if this is a good term. I'm inclined to th I'm doubting whether it is a good term, but it's it's one I was attracted to, that, that it's not endorsed. It's not part of the machinery of the mind that's open to, to conscious endor endorsement in the way that judgment is. I mean, that's the classic contrast. Judgment may not be under direct voluntary control, but there's a sense in which it's part of the mind that's open for endorsement and it's under reflective control, even if you can't choose what to believe. Okay. So those are three notions of implicit, implicit as covert, implicit as unconscious, and implicit as non-endorsed or not under reflective control. Okay, what's the connection? Well, here's the, here's the tangential, uh, here's the tenuous connection. There's sort of two issues raised by all three forms of implicit cognition. One is an ontological one. What kinds of states are we dealing with? Our, our folk psychological vocabulary is grounded in explicit cognition. Talk of beliefs is grounded in explicit beliefs. And when we try and extend it to implicit forms of cognition, yeah, 
I can kind of do so, but it strains a little bit, it creaks. Um, and that's why a lot of us are inclined to think, well, maybe we should come up with new terms, like alias, because the old terms are creaking. And then other people say, no, that's mad, they're just beliefs. But then you say, well, what do you mean by beliefs? <laughs> they say, well, it's not what you thought. <laughs> it's a little bit different, <laughs> not having anyone in mind. Um, so, you know, there are ontological questions, right? Our paradigmatic examples of, of, of the kinds of states that we're dealing with are explicit in, very, in various ways. Um, there are challenges in thinking about what kind of states we're dealing with in implicit. The focus, uh, the rest of the talk is really on the epistemic issues. Uh, like how do we go about ascribing these things? Whatever exactly these things are, how do we go about ascribing them? Okay, back to uh, implicit cognition in vegetative states, patients. Um, and this quote, right? again, we've got the behavioral evidence is difficult, inconsistent, hard to detect, so we need the activation studies. <coughs> okay. But how exactly are we going to go use the neural evidence? So I'm going to go through this um, in a somewhat pedantic fashion because I think looking at the philosophical framework is actually kind of useful. What we're really interested in what is often called creature consciousness is the patient conscious. But how do we get there? We can't eyeball creature consciousness directly. Or at least it's not obvious that, I mean, maybe we can't in principle. Maybe we can in principle, but certainly we're not in a position to do that yet. So what we do is we try and come up with an description of a conscious state, or maybe a conscious process, or a conscious capacity. I'm just going to talk about states for now, not worry about the difference between those things. And we infer that it must be creature that the creature must be conscious because it's in the conscious state. I think, in a sense, that inference is completely unproblematic because I think of conscious states as determinants of creature consciousness. It's like inferring that something must be colored because it's red. It's got to be, right? Because reds are determinable of being colored. But there is something worth noting here that even though there's a sense in which if you instantiate properties at this level, you must instantiate that property, there is also kind of a top-down constraint in how the arguments go. There are, as it were, what I think of as rebutting objections that can be thought of at this level of analysis. So here's the kind of thing I have in mind. Suppose you were to argue that capacities A and B are closely associated, such that a conscious creature who possesses A is also very likely to possess B. Right? You think of conscious creatures, they're agents, they've got to have this suite of personal level capacities, and it's just not the case that you can pull this capacity apart from that capacity. Or even if you can, it's very rare that they dissociate, so they ought to go together. And then you argue that not only do you not have any evidence that creature S has capacity B, you have evidence that they don't have capacity B. And that gives you some reason to think that they lack capacity A. In other words, what you're doing is you're saying, well, actually, I have some evidence of this. If the creature actually is in this state or has this capacity, then they're conscious. But if they were conscious, they ought to have all this other stuff. They don't have that, so probably my evidence is, is defeated. Sort of a rebutting defeater rather than an undercutting defeater. Right? That, I think, is a very fertile ground of investigation. I'm not going to say anything more about it here. I'm not going to try and give you an argument of this form. I think they're actually difficult to defend for lots of reasons. One is we're dealing with brain damaged subjects and it's really often unclear whether we expect capacities to be associated in the context of brain damage. So we've got to somehow work out whether cap capacities that look like they're associated are associated only in neurotypical individuals have a normal level of consciousness or whether there's a deep connection between them such that they ought to be associated even in brain damage contexts. That's really, really difficult. But I do think this is a really interesting line of argument that ought to be given more attention than it has been. What I'm going to focus on is really this um, level, or actually more to the point, really this level. How do you get from the brain data to, to the conscious state? All right, there are two ways to do that. There are two strategies which uh, are called the direct strategy and the indirect strategy. So what I'm going to do now is talk about the direct strategy, give you some reasons uh, for thinking it's problematic, <coughs> and then we're going to focus on three examples of, of the indirect strategy and talk through some um, issues raised by them. Here's the direct strategy. 
You've got your neural state. It's associated with conscious state in neurotypical patients. You use your fMRI, your EEG, whatever, to identify that the subject's in that neural state, and then your FERT's in the conscious state. So graphically, you've got your neural state. You think there's some kind of correlation, some association with that, um, and then you go from there. Now, the sort of two problems have uh, been raised against this. I think one of them is the most popular, well, one of them is the most popular problem, um, the problem that people give for rejecting the direct strategy. I don't think it's uh, such a serious problem, but I think there's another problem which is more serious. <laughs> so here's... <coughs> it's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's not an objection, I take it. <laughs> um, so here's, here's a problem which I think can be met. Um, it's a problem involving um, um, multiple mappings from neural states to conscious states. So the rever and it's also called the reverse inference problem. So many people have pointed out that um, it looks like instead of there being a one-one mapping here, there are actually, for many kinds of neural states, a one-many mapping. Um, depends on the grain of neural state that you're talking about, so there are lots of tricky issues here. But at least for many kind of neural states, and certainly the kind of neural states that are talked about in this literature, um, you can find contexts in which uh, neurotypical patients seem to be in this mental state, this mental state, or this mental state. And people have used this worry um, and have said that this undermines any kind of um, at any kind of attempt to use the neural information to ascribe consciousness to vegetative state patients. Um, I don't think it's a particularly um, good objection, and I think worries about reverse inference have been um, overplayed. I think um, actually Edward's got a nice uh, Edward's got a nice paper pointing out ways in which reverse inference um, can be saved, as it were. But I think it's particularly poor in this context. Um, one reason is you can screen off alternative interpretations, as it were, of, of the neural data, because you know something about the patient. <laughs> it's not as though you've just walked into the lab, someone's turned on the fMRI machine when no one else was looking, and it just so happens that a certain bit of the brain is active. If that's what was going on, then you wouldn't be able to screen off, you know, you would have a bunch of possible interpretations of what that neural activity was going on. But what, in fact, you've got is you know something about the environmental context that stimulated the neural response. Um, there's some particular input, and typically the neural response is time-locked to that. So you've got, as it were, ways of ruling out alternative interpretations um, that might otherwise be plausible um, of the neural activity. You've got ways of screening off. Um, in effect, what you really have, I mean, the more plausible version of the direct strategy is neural state in a particular environment is associated with conscious state. And that doesn't have so obviously a one-many mapping. It's more like a one-one mapping. Or at least you can tell a more plausible story as to that it would be a one-one mapping. Um, so I think reverse inference worries um, have been over overplayed. I th but I, there is a, a more serious problem with versions of the direct strategy, which is this. What does it mean for a neural state to be associated with a particular type of conscious state? What people have in mind by this phrase is something like um, this notion associated with the neural correlates literature. So if you see visual motion, you might um, see differential activity in V5. And people say, that's the neural state associated with visual motion. That's the neural correlate of visual motion. That's fine, but what you really have is what I like to call a differentiating correlate. It's, as it were, the bit of the brain that seems differentially responsive to visual motion. Um, but it's not, at least we don't have any reason, just looking at that paradigm, to think of it as a complete total neural basis of the experience of visual motion. Right? We have conscious states. I mean, these kinds of experimental data are on in subjects who are, we know to be independently conscious. And for all we know, this activity might generate a conscious state only when it involves lots of other activity in the brain. Maybe we have independent evidence to rule that out, but just this kind of paradigm doesn't give us that. Right? So there are going to be differentiating NCCs and non-differentiating NCCs, right? neural activity that seems to be involved in a whole lot of states. Um, and you need the whole lot, potentially, to generate one of these. Um, well, so the whole thing is, you might call it a total correlate, 
that's the NCC that's sufficient, minimally sufficient, for a conscious experience of visual motion. <laughs> what we don't know with these patients is whether um, the non-differentiating bed <laughs> is, in, is intact. That's precisely what we don't know. Um, and the direct strategy is not going to give us that. Okay, so what about the indir indirect strategy? Here, here's how it goes. Again, you, you start from the same point, neural state. Then you have what I'd like to think in, in terms of best explanation. Um, so this is one. The best explanation of why they're in that neural state appeals to the fact in a particular psychological state. Then you have a claim about that being good evidence to consciousness, and you put that together. So you've really got two critical points here. You've got a claim about realization. Well, it doesn't have to be put in terms of realization, but it's, uh, it's a useful label. And then what I'm calling the contrastive premise. Contrastive because the idea is that M um, brings with it evidence of consciousness um, because you wouldn't have M or you wouldn't have M in these um, conditions in this context um, if, it, if it wasn't conscious. There's a contrast between conscious and unconscious processing, conscious and unconscious states. And uh, so what I want to do now is go through um, three kind of paradigms where people have deployed their indirect strategy um, and talk a little bit about some of the problems that you get when you try and defend both the realization premise and the contrastive premise. Okay, and all of these paradigms, in a sense, take as their point of departure this kind of gloss. So some people have looked at evidence, covert evidence of language processing, some have looked at covert evidence of volition and purpose, and some have looked at awareness of the self or the environment. I'm going to start with what people generally think is the weakest evidence uh, and suggest that maybe it's not entirely useless. Um, so the first set of studies in these patients uh, involved language comprehension. Looked like there was differential response to the patient's name. Patient's name contrasted with other first names. Speech versus acoustically matched noise. And perhaps most provocatively, semantic processing of ambiguous words. And one reason this is pro provocative is that patients taking propofol, who you know moderately anesthetized, uh, didn't show this activation. Kind of interesting. Not entirely clear what that in itself shows, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> that's what you say when you don't know what to say <laughs> about something. It's kind of it's kind of think talk amongst the, talk about it amongst yourselves. Um, okay, people report this stuff by way of warming everyone up and then say, ah, it's not really evidence of consciousness. Doesn't give us the sort of bottom-up inference that I've been looking at. Doesn't give us a plausible indirect argument for the ascription of consciousness. I'm not so sure. Right. Here's the problem with it. There's an undercutting defeater. <coughs> because covert um, but unconscious semantic processing speech can be elicited in conscious subjects, there's no reason to think that covert processing of speech seen in VS patients is conscious. That's, that's the argument people give. I don't know about the no. I mean, evidence comes in degrees. We're not looking for decisive evidence here. The fact that you can get covert but unconscious semantic processing in conscious subjects is interesting. Does it mean that this is not any evidence? I mean, the real question is under what conditions can covert but unconscious semantic processing of speech be elicited? Now, I don't know the literature hugely well, um, and it's probably not good form to focus all your efforts on a paper that was born around about the time you were. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know of a whole lot of other studies in this vein. So if people know of other dichotic listening studies that are perhaps more rigorous, because methods have improved since 1973, please let me know. I've asked around and I haven't been able to find that. There's a lot in vision, a lot of stuff in vision, but in audition, not, not so much. But anyway, um, what Lackner and Garrett found is so dichotic listening, you've got two channels, attended channel and unattended channel, which they take to be unconscious. People are unconscious of at least the semantic content of the material presented in the unattended channel. Um, and it looks like it primes, resolves ambiguity in the attended channel. Um, but of course, what you have here is an attentional effect because you need people to attend to one channel. Right, you've got to manipulate attention. It just doesn't work otherwise. So, what they showed is there's no 
I mean, argu arguably, what this shows is that there's no s decisive influ inference from semantic processing of speech to consciousness. Because you can get semantic processing of speech outside of consciousness. Let's grant that. Um, doesn't show that semantic processing of speech isn't some kind of evidence of, of consciousness. How much do we know about the capacity for top-down attention in these prisons? Not much. I mean, we don't know that they're diverse. They've had different kinds of brain damage in different areas. Some have had um, car accidents. Some have had anoxia, which has different kinds of um, effects in the, in the system. So, and, and we just don't know a whole lot about the degree to which they may be able to allocate attention to the speech that's coming in. Um, and as I'm going to kind of gesture at later on, there's actually evidence in some patients that there is some kind of top-down processing, some, um, which you know you would have to control for somehow, and, and it just clearly wasn't controlled for. People just presented the speech. Um, so there's a lot more to say here, but the upshot seems to be is we need to know more about the conditions under which unconscious semantic processing occurs to know whether this is really any evidence and how strong an evidence it is. But the mere, I mean, the, the simple point, the main point is a simple one. The mere fact that you can get it for subjects who are conscious but not conscious of the semantic uh, content doesn't in and of itself show uh, that it's not evidence of consciousness in these patients. Okay, that's language comprehension. I want to talk now about a study that many of you will know about, but it may be news to some of you. So now we're talking about agency in uh, vegetative state patients. Um, and the famous study, probably the most famous study in this field by Owen in 2006. So it was a 23-year-old woman uh, who'd been in vegetative state for a while. Um, and she was given two kinds of instructions. Um, she was told to imagine playing tennis on some trials, other trials to imagine visiting the room of her house. Uh, and here's uh, what they found. So the controls are down there. The patient is up here, um, and they found um, activation in areas that you would sort of antecedently expect in connection with those commands in the patient, um, same areas with the controls. Um, I actually prefer uh, this way of representing the data um, because the, the patient here is open circles, and you can't pick her out just by, you know, if you didn't know she was the patient, you wouldn't be able to pick her out from, from this graph. What neither of these representations of the data give you, and that there's a sense in which both of them are misleading, is the fact that the activity was time-locked. So it's not just the where of the neural state, wh which is something. I think actually the more interesting feature of it is the when. The fact that it started in response to the command and it seemed to stop 30 seconds later when she was told to stop. So there's a, a spatial-temporal aspect to the neural state that's really, really important. Um, right, so that's uh, the basic data. You could try and cook the argument for consciousness up using a direct inference. I'm not going to do that, but some of the literature seems to assume that that's the only way of interpreting this data. I don't think it's the best interpretation. Um, and it's not the interpretation that the authors give. They seem to have an indirect inference in mind, although they're not always super clear about that. So here's what they say. These results confirm that despite fulfilling the clinical criteria for diagnosis of vegetative state, she retained the ability to understand spoken commands, respond to them through brain activity rather than through speech or movement. Her decision to cooperate with the authors by imagining particular tasks when asked to do so represents a clear act of intention, which confirmed beyond any doubt that she was consciously aware of herself and her surroundings. I don't think it's a good idea in science to use the phrase beyond any doubt, <laughs> but I'm not a scientist, so... Uh, what's the argument? Something like this is the most natural reading of passages like that. There's a realization claim about the neural activity realizing intentional agency. There's a contrastive present premise that intentional agency is indicative of consciousness, and then you put the two together. Both premises have come under fire. So Nativ and Hacker have argued that there's no reason to think that we're dealing with intentional agency here because intentional agency involves the possibility of making a choice, but there's no possibility of testing whether that capacity is being exercised or not. Like, there's no way of distinguishing her not understanding the command or not being conscious 
expresses her choosing not to cooperate. So there's no possibility of making a choice. Attention requires choice, therefore it's not intentional action. Zoe <laughs> has um, also worried about whether it's an intentional action in her paper, intentional action in the post-coma patient. Um, and there's lots in that paper, just, I mean, here one, one quotation, um, one aspect of, of Zoe's worries. When someone has mental imagery of themselves playing tennis, they are certainly in a mental state of imagining, but that leaves open whether they're imagining the relevant scenario is an intentional mental action or a mere mental happening. Right? So there's a distinction between mental ha mere mental happenings, full-blooded intentional actions, um, and Zoe argues that we don't have any <coughs> evidence um, that it's really an intentional action. So one way to think about what's going on is um, we're given mere happenings, we're given fully-fledged intentional actions as our only choices, uh, and both Hacker, um, Zoe, Colin Klein, um, recently argued for similar things, has said we don't really have any evidence of that, maybe we've just got, got this. Um, I'm inclined to think that actually when it comes to agency, clean mental agency, we've got a whole raft, it's more of a continuum. There are things that some philosophers call activities, like pacing around as one does when one gives a talk, or doodling or fiddling with one's hair when one's listening to a talk. Um, they're not fully fledged intentional actions. They certainly don't involve conscious choice, conscious intentions of the kind that one uses to monitor one's actions. Um, they have a certain kind of ballistic nature to them, but they're not mere happenings. I mean, there are things one does, one paces, one doodles, one fiddles. Um, and maybe the kind of activity that we see in the patient is, is something like that. Maybe there is no conscious choice. Maybe it was a mistake to describe um, what we see in those terms. Maybe there's no conscious intention to do X or to make sure that one is doing X or to inhibit competing stimuli. There's no need to in inhibition because there's no other competing stimuli coming in. Um, but I'm not sure I'm convinced it's a mere happening. But even if it is in some sense a mere happening, even if I'm wrong about that, um, there's other ways of reconstructing, reconstructing the argument. So Zoe, Colin Klein, others have focused on this bit of what Owen et al. say, um, which is fair enough because that's their focus. But they also say this earlier bit, right? The patient retained the ability to understand spoken commands and to respond to them through her brain activity. So even if it's a mere happening, it's a happening that is a command response, and to make the response, she has to understand what's being told. So the argument people are focused on is this one, because that's the one that Owen seemed to have give, seems to give. That's the one that in previous work, I guess I probably gave. Uh, and maybe that's no good. I mean, maybe that's over-egging the omelet, as they say in some senior common rooms. Uh, <laughs> but there's a more plausible um, version of the argument, which is she's aware of the command. Um, which maybe it's a less sexy version <coughs> of, of the argument, but it still gets you, you know, you've got, you only need a conscious state here. Doesn't matter what kind of conscious state. You just need something, and you, it's a determinant of, of that, so you've got consciousness in the future. Okay. Even if we, so, so let's suppose that we go back to the standard construal of the argument in terms of intentional agency. There are other objections. So I've been focusing on um, the worry about whether N realizes intentional agency. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it just realizes a happening, but maybe that happening is still evidence of consciousness. But there's also this worry, the contrastive inference. So Neil Levy got a little bit of airtime yesterday. I'm going to give him some more airtime. Um, he points out that there are syndromes in which apparently unconscious subjects engage in all kinds of activities, some of it sophisticated, in the apparent absence of consciousness. And people often talk about epileptic absence seizures here and the like. Well, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I just, I don't. I worry. I'm a worrier. Um, the first thing, it's not at all clear that these individuals are unconscious. They're not self-conscious. They don't have conscious intentions. They're not reflectively conscious. Um, but presumably, they're conscious of the traffic light. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe they're not. But I, I just we don't have any evidence that they're not. Um, um, and the other thing, it's, this is sort of a, a two-quote query, I guess, but command following is the standard indicator of consciousness in the middle and conscious state. So if we're really serious about this kind of worry, 
let's put our money where our mouth is, and we need to rethink everything from the bottom up. Because we're granted that there's command following in the, in, in the covert cognition. So now we need to say, well, covert, you know, command following um, shouldn't be diagnostic of consciousness even when it's accompanied by behavior. Okay, so we've talked about language comprehension. We've talked about agency in this, in this Owen case. By the way, a lot of other apparently vegetative state patients show the tennis playing kind of thing. It's not just this one patient, but um, a non... Um, a, a significant number of, of patients have, have, sh have showed the capacity to play tennis. Um, let me talk briefly about uh, a study that's just come out, um, which is uh, really interesting. It's got a not very helpful title. I don't think this title is really tells you what's going on in the study at all. <laughs> um, but that's what it's called. It comes out, came out in PNAS last year. So what they did is they had um, normal subjects, and they had two vegetative state patients, or apparently vegetative state patients, uh, watch an eight-minute clip um, from an Alfred Hitchcock film, Bang Bang, You're Dead, which you can see online. It's a great, great little film, actually. So uh, it's a gun control film. Um, and what's really interesting about it is it's got a plot that um, it's not super complex, but there's a lot of suspense. I mean, Hitchcock's the master of suspense. You've got to understand the plot to really get the suspense. So the little boy um, has a gun which is loaded and he goes around shooting people um, and it, you know, he's in effect playing Russian roulette but none of the adults know that. You know, so that's why there's a high level of suspense because you think at any moment he might shoot someone. Um, and um, they showed this film um, in an as is um, and I think that's the as is version in a scrambled version um, so, sorry, uh, A is the yeah, as is, B is resting state, C is scrambled, so they just mixed it up, um, mixed up the orders of the, of the slide, um, and saw kind of what you'd expect to see, that when you're process when you're seeing the film, um, there's a lot of executive activity, right? You've got to follow the plot. So there's working memory demands, you've got to put things together. Um, and I'm running uh, low on time, so... Uh, D is, what is D? D is um, the particular correlations in the particular areas. So I think D is basically A minus C, minus, um, minus just the low-level primary, you know, yeah. minus the sensory stuff. So they're trying to pick out what's the bit um, that is specifically activated by, the, by following the plot. Um, and um, they had two independent, uh, two measures of, as it were, the plot, if you like, or suspense. So one was people rating different moments in the plot for a degree of suspense, um, and that's what they call a qualitative measure of, um, let's call it executive function, right, ability to follow the plot. Um, and then there was a quantitative, which was they gave them a dual task sort of um, paradigm, so they had to do um, <laughs> some kind of working memory thing, and performance dropped off at various points because they were trying to follow the plot, right? So you can't, you can't do two attention executively demanding things at once equally well. Um, and then they used that to see how well you could predict activity in executive areas. Patient one, the two BS patients, patient one only showed the kind of audio visual response that you, that you see, right? So that, as it were, only showed the kind of thing that you see in the scrambled version of the film. Patient two is the star. Um, patient two is the interesting person who'd been in vegetative state for 16 years. Um, looked like they were getting the same kind of executive responses that the healthy controls were getting. Now, there's a lot of sort of technical details, independent components analysis, and a lot of fancy stuff that I'm not in a position to talk about, but I want to focus on the, 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 the philosophical bit. Um, so let's, let's look at the argument. There's the realization premise. Neural data is best explained by supposing the patient was following the plot. I, I'm going to grant that. I mean, there's lots to say about it, but I'm, I'm going to grant it. Plot following is good evidence for consciousness. That's the contrastive premise that they're assuming. Um, so we've evidence evidence confidence, evidence for consciousness. Um, is plot following good evidence for consciousness? <laughs> uh, it's a sixty-four thousand dollar question, isn't it? I mean. Anyone who was here yesterday might worry about the kinds of things that Eric was worrying about. 
evidence for unconscious modus ponens. Presumably following a plot involves things like modus ponens. There's some evidence, and this is the new flavor of the month in consciousness science, of things like unconscious working memory. Um, there's a symposium on this at the ASSC in Paris in a month or so. Um, people have always assumed working memory has got to be conscious, but people are finding some evidence of working memory-like processes that seem to be unconscious. But again, this is sort of a familiar point. Under what conditions do you get unconscious influence, unconscious working memory? So the working memory without consciousness, the Soto studies, um, the reverberary study that Eric talked about, um, you've got prime stimuli that presented for, I think in this one, they're, they're forward masked and backward masked, and they're presented for 16 and a half milliseconds. <laughs> so, you, you know, you can get it if you're really, really clever and look really, really, really hard for it, maybe. Um, again, these, these stimuli were forward masked and backward masked and presented for 50 milliseconds. So, yeah, okay, you can get it. Um, you can get wet streets when the neighbors turn the sprinklers on, but that doesn't mean that wet streets isn't evidence of rain. <laughs> Sweat streets are evidence of rain. So maybe the fact, you know, uh, go back to our argument here, it might still be good evidence, not knock down demonstrative evidence, because maybe you can get plot following outside of consciousness. Um, and maybe the kind of unconscious thought, unconscious inference um, literature that Eric was um, talking about yesterday problematizes arguments of this kind, but I'm not sure that undermines it. Okay, I had um, a little bit of philosophy about a prior justifications and a posterior justifications, but I've been going on too long, so I'll go to my take-home message. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what this is your take-home message when you don't have a take-home message. It's a meta take-home message. It's complicated. I mean, I think arguments for the existence of consciousness are less straightforward than people have thought. Objections, uh, not objects. Objections are less straightforward than people have thought. There's lots more moving bits than I think people have generally reckoned. So thanks. <laughs>